Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to you all, from those down the road to the folks around the world. Welcome to the next Wednesday weekly video. You've probably seen in the title that this is all about Scotland, the legends, the myths, the history, and also the cities. But what do you think about when I say or talk about Scotland? Do you think of the iron brew drinking, deep fried Mars bars eating, kilt wearing with its accompanying sporran? It's not a bum bag, it's not a fanny pack, it's a sporran. Or maybe even you get your things or your, your, your perceptions of Scotland through pop culture. You might have heard Mel Gibson screaming FREEDOM in Braveheart, or you might have even heard uh, Disney's Brave with Princess Merida going, do you want to change your fate? Or maybe even Mrs Doubtfire going, oh, oh dearie, just a wee tipple for me. Um, and then there's Outlander. I haven't seen Outlander. It's, it's just a TV show about Jacobite Scotland. I'll get onto that. But I suppose these ideas, these perceptions of Scotland have probably all been passed through by the, the, the tales, the legends, the history of, of medieval Scotland, most notably from two of its greatest heroes, William Wallace and King Robert the Bruce, both of whom operated about 700 years ago, at a time when Scotland was being hotly contested between uh, notable Scottish royals and Scottish families, and also Edward I of England, who also decided to try and take claim to the Scottish Kingdom. Now, William Wallace was immortalised uh, with a monument built eh, around 200 years ago, granted, but his monument stands upon one of the tallest hills of Scotland, in, in Stirling, sorry, um, close to the site of his famous battle of Stirling Bridge, fought in 1297, where he fought the English across the bridge. The English were stood stock still like any medieval army, just in a line. As, as, as any medieval army would. But the Scots decided to take a different approach of their unorthodox methods uh, and eventually won. Now this bridge, I'll go into a little bit of detail here, this bridge was geographically and politically significant because it was the only way in which you were to enter the heart of Scotland. Now Stirling is in a sort of a valley and has the Trussocks over to the north of them, which is a sort of mountain range part of the highlands. And it also has uh, two important rivers that sort of surround the city and go back out. One of which goes to the North Sea and the other goes to the Irish Sea. And obviously, due to the rain that Scotland frequently gets, uh, it floods. So this valley and this, this sort of area would flood. So the Stirling Bridge was integral into getting into the heart of Scotland and laying claim to uh, the Scottish Kingdom. Stirling Castle had been taken by the English and when William Wallace uh, defeated the English army in 1297, he quickly managed to reclaim the castle and lived for another about nine or ten years until, unremarkably, he was turned over to the English by one of the Scottish, one of the Scottish knights who were loyal to the King of England. He was hung, drawn and quartered with his head placed on a spike on London Bridge. Unremarkable, but still, he was immortalised in legend, he became a hero of Scotland, but Robert the Bruce was also able to immortalise himself into Scottish legend and become a hero in his own right. He would become the guardian of Scotland following William Wallace's death. And just a year later, in 1306, he would become King Robert I of Scotland. At a time where there was a lot less contestation in Scotland for the kingdom. Uh, England's forces were going to make a last ditch attempt uh, during the 1310s, but ultimately this would fail. Now, this would fail because Robert the Bruce would win the decisive victory, and if not the most famous victory in Scottish history, the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. He faced off against the English, he was outnumbered, he was outmanned, 
but he won it. He won the decisively, and he claimed Scotland in the name for the Scottish at that point. Moving on to Stirling Castle. Stirling Castle would be the home to the kings and queens of Scotland from the time of Robert the Bruce until James VI of Scotland packed his bags, moved to England, and became King of England as well. Now, the oldest brick that you can find at Stirling Castle dates back to the 1380s. Um, the oldest known structure to have been at the castle dates from around 1100s. But most of what you see today dates from around 1500 until about um, 1700. James IV, James V, and James VI of Scotland all operated in the 1500s and constructed mo the majority of the forecourt, or the foreworks as it is known, of Stirling Castle. James IV started the overseeing the project of the Great Hall in 1500, completed three years later. It is regarded as the largest great hall in Scotland, with 350 oak timbers slotted together to form the great ceiling that you will now be able to see. Now, because Stirling Castle had become a military barracks until 1964, a lot of what had happened to the Great Hall and Stirling Castle had been sort of changed and modified to suit the military needs. Therefore, the Great Hall that James IV had once built had been deconstructed, changed, augmented uh, to suit the purposes of the military. But obviously, once the military had left, and the historical conservations came in, uh, there was a big drive in the year 2000 to restore the Great Hall to its original form that you would have seen in 15th, 1500, using again 350 oak timbers, which you've just seen, uh, using exactly the same methods, exactly the same tools uh, and crafts to construct this almost picture-perfect ceiling that would have been uh, adored by many uh, early modernists uh, of, of, the, of the Tudor period. Now moving round the forecourt, you come to the Palace of Princely Virtue, which builders under James V constructed during the late 1530s and early 1540s. On the outer walls there are great sculptures, um, some of which face the iron gates, the, the, the entrance to the castle, most of the sculptures in which are rather satanic, with evil looking faces and in sort of almost preposterous uh, stances, but sort of on the inside, where the royals would most likely see, there would be sculptures of Greek gods, including Jupiter, Venus, and the like. You know, and even James V himself was slotted and carved into the corner of the palace, the palace itself. Though he would never come to see this palace because he died a year before its completion in 1543. But the most interesting part of this palace of princely virtue comes in the form of the sterling heads, something which I will now show you. The sterling heads, as you can rightly see, were wooden rounds that would hold 
the bust or face of some of the most important figures of the Tudor period, some of whom were ancient uh, Romans, such as Julius Caesar, uh, some were Greek heroes, such as Hercules, others were courtiers and people that you would see around the Scottish court, and to honour his mother, Margaret Tudor, who, let, let, let me draw you a graph. So, James V, his mother was Margaret Tudor, who was the sister to Henry VIII, and the wife to James IV. There you go. There's a, there's a, there's a sterling head for her. These heads would have been placed upon the ceiling of one of the king's lodgings. Now, unfortunately, as you can see, these heads are sort of in the slight disrepair and they're in glass cases. But when you enter what, the king's lodgings, uh, you can see in a painted version of the same sterling heads upon the ceilings. So you could really see what they would have looked like and what they would have and how sort of magnificent and beautiful they would have been. They've even been classed as the second crown jewels of Scotland. The painted ones are rather garish, they're, they're in sort of bright colours, and the bright colours can also be seen along the outside walls of the forecourt. It was painted in what is known as the King's Gold, just to show the posterity, the wealth, the power that the kings and queens of Scotland had. Plus, it also made you stand out because no other palace or castle actually had this golden layer plastered all along the outside walls of the, of the forecourt. It also shows you that Due to the Scottish weather, the, the rain, the winds, it could be bitterly cold sometimes in this, in this valley, as I've mentioned. Um, the structures of the castle which were, were made of soapstone, so it was a very porous, and very easily weather damaged substance. So this, this king's gold would serve as a protective layer. And finally, you have the Chapel Royal, constructed by James VI of Scotland. Now, there was already a chapel within the castle. Every castle and royal palace within England, within Scotland, anywhere, anywhere that was Christian, there was always a chapel. But James VI, in the 1590s, decided, nope, I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to construct a new one. He constructed it to the specific size, diameter, width, height, whatever, specific shape of the Temple of Solomon, one of the most famous Christian sites in the Holy Land, the Middle East. He constructed this chapel, or he had builders construct this chapel. It took seven months. You can't get an extension on your house in the same amount of time, let alone a whole building. Yeah, yes, the, the, the Temple of Solomon is a rather small and basic looking chapel, but it is no less significant because at a time when construction was basic and it was rather more difficult to put things together, you know, you don't have the same sort of technologies and that the constructors use today in the 21st century, it's still an impressive feat, seven months, seven months to construct fully functioning, fully working chapel. And by the time you get to sort of the late, later, latter part of the century and beyond, it becomes a military barracks, as I mentioned, until 1964. Stirling Castle, in the years following James's departure from Scotland, uh, Stirling Castle only saw two significant sieges that are, are worth noting. 
The first came in the English Civil War, 1651. Oliver Cromwell decided to besiege Stirling Castle from the local churchyard, the Church of the Holy Rood, which, if you imagine sort of Stirling Castle on this big hill, just a little way down, there is a, a, a church, the Church of the Holy Rood, which was also used uh, in official occasions and was the sort of the main church within Stirling. He, Oliver Cromwell, would set up his cannons within the churchyard and also famously put one cannon within the church clock tower to get more of a direct attack. Now, the second most important siege to Stirling Castle came in 1745 from the Jacobite Rebellion. Now, these rebels were trying to reinstigate the true kings of England after James II of England had been ousted in 1689. So this problem had been rumbling on for many, many years. In 1745, the Jacobite rebels decided to take a leaf out of Oliver Cromwell's book. They would set up their cannons, their, their siege engines, uh, in the Church of the Holy Rood. But there was a problem, you see, because the townsfolk of Stirling, the city people, decided that, hold on, if you start shooting at them, they'll shoot at us, or they'll shoot at you, and then subsequently us in the back, and the town will get completely and utterly destroyed, and it will be a nightmare. Can you move? Can you move your siege engines to a different hill, or to a different area to siege? So they did. They took their cannons, and they set up themselves upon a slightly smaller sort of sub-hill right next to Stirling Castle. This was to be the worst decision that they could have made, because they were absolutely demolished. They were a stone's throw from the castle itself. They were prime pickings for the new seven, six, sorry, six-gun battery of cannons that had been recently installed in Stirling Castle's outer defence. Ah, if you like this video, please do comment and click the like button. Do tell me anything you want to tell me about, you know, maybe Scotland, other sort of significant things that you may know about Scotland or Stirling itself. This was sort of a bogged down and eh, slightly rushed uh, video about Stirling and Scotland itself. Um, but I still hope that you all enjoyed it. Again, like, comment, please do subscribe to the channel. And unfortunately, next week I might have to miss a video because I am super stressed about university work. I am a student after all. Uh, but don't worry, I will be back the following week with another video. And importantly, I may... Please, link, please wait for updates on this, but I may be doing a uh, live stream uh, in the next uh, week or so. So please look for updates on that. You can find all of the updates for that and any of the other future videos in the uh, description below with the Facebook and the Instagram accounts that I have. 